Um, the, that's Daniel Abraham, Center for Middle East Peace, which I'm privileged to be a part of, uh, has one simple objective, uh, which is to work with the governments of Israel, the Palestinians, the United States government, uh, European governments, and others to uh, help resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The good thing about the job, it's a long-term prospect. <laughs> um, but let me, let me um, if I could, it's a, it's a privilege uh, to be here. It's a privilege for me to, and a special privilege to be with David and, and Nathan, uh, who are uh, much more capable and much smarter than I am in their respective fields. And you heard already from uh, two that are sitting up front here, as well as Ambassador Ross, that I heard three people that offered, I think, uh, exceptionally uh, astute observations in terms of the uh, current situation between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the broader implications in the region, uh, and now we're supposed to focus on American-Israeli interactions. Um, and maybe because I'm possibly the only one who was foolish enough to hold himself up for public office, offer a bit of a different perspective. Uh, in my final year in Congress, in 2009, uh, President Obama's first year in office, um, a, a phenomenon happened that I didn't quite figure out until I was maybe halfway through it. Um, the Egyptian foreign minister at the time, Kuwaiti diplomats, uh, Lebanese diplomats, Israeli diplomats at times, the diplomats of the Middle East would come into my office and invariably the discussion would start in one form or another like this. How's the health care debate going? Is President Obama going to push for a public option? Is he going to succeed? And I found myself getting into debates, or not debates, discussions, with Middle Eastern diplomats about the cost or the difference between the Republican plan and the Democratic plan on health care. And before I realized it, after the fourth or fifth time, I said, what is going on here? Surely, the Egyptian foreign minister really doesn't have a stake in a public option. And whether or not the Democrats in the House of Representatives and President Obama are successful. And certainly they did not. But what they were doing, which is what I would respectfully suggest governments will be doing probably for the next six months, is they are trying to figure out how strong is President Obama. Is he a strong president? Is he a mediocrely, that's not a word, strong president? Or is he a weak president? And I would respectfully suggest that as important as the substance is, which you have heard from the best people you can hear from all morning and now again from David and from Nathan, that possibly the most important things that will happen in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the other surrounding issues in the Middle East is how the budget debate is resolved here in Washington. And I'm not talking about whether or not the Pentagon cuts are at one percentage or another. I'm talking about the narrative at the end. Did President Obama come out a winner or not? And if he comes out a winner, I would say then that there is one scenario that is possible in the Middle East. If he comes out neutral or a loser, there's an entirely different scenario. And David, I think, correctly pointed out that the ultimate question may be Iran in terms of what is possible, but I would possibly add something to the question of Iran. Surely the question of Iran and whether or not Iran becomes a nuclear power and whether or not President Obama's policy of containment is successful on the substance is all especially critical. But I would argue there's probably even a more important aspect to the Iranian question, and that is President Obama, I would argue, argue more explicitly than any president has ever done on any question of national security in our modern times, has essentially put his credibility on the line and has said, effectively, Iran will not become a nuclear weapon holder on my watch, meaning his watch, of course. And should he be successful, he's a much stronger president. Should he fail, or should there be grayness 
in the result. He will be a much weaker president. So to David's point that maybe it will take some big bang occurrence, which might just be the resolution of the Iranian nuclear weapon quest, whether it be through diplomacy and a negotiation, or whether it be through a military action, I would argue that's true, absolutely. But also on top of that, the result, again, the narrative, not whether or not the specifics of the negotiated settlement says enrichment will have at this level or that level, or the inspection will incur at this place or that place and how many times a year, but essentially the view, did President Obama come out victorious or not? And if he did, I would argue, and this is where some in the room will certainly say I'm biased, and I am, I admit it, I'm a big fan of the president. And certainly some will say I'm just a romanticist, an optimist that just can't see, see clearly, and I admit that too. All of the harsh realities that you've learned this morning and will continue to learn are all true. It's conventional wisdom and it's wise and it's sage advice. But I would offer this observation. If President Obama can help resolve the budget issues of the United States of America in the next three or four months in a relatively, no doubt, ugly manner, but successful. And if the United States of America, through negotiation or through military action, essentially resolves the Iranian nuclear weapon quest in the next six to eight months, which arguably may happen. And if the American economy is not on some extraordinary ascension, which no doubt it will be, but if it is on a general curve upwards, you're looking at a fairly strong president or the potential for a fairly strong president for then the next three to three and a half years. And if that's the case, again, I think David is right. We've got a new Secretary of State. I think David's exactly right on the first half of what he said, which is President Obama says to Senator Kerry, Secretary Kerry to be, hopefully, John, go for it. It's your issue. You want it. You're a very able guy. Do what you can do. I don't think the second part of President Obama's statement will be exactly as David said, which was, if I remember correctly, just keep it away from me. I think it will be more like, when you have something good to report, let me know. <laughs> President Obama will probably wisely think it'll be a while that he'll hear from Secretary Kerry on this issue. However, and this is where I'll stop because I don't know if you've heard about it yet, I think there's something brewing that actually may be more important and more potent than people realize. And that is in Paris, in Berlin, in London, the leaders of Europe are getting pretty darn frustrated. They're getting frustrated with us here in Washington. They're getting especially frustrated with the Israeli leadership, and in many ways no less frustrated with the Palestinian leadership. And for their own politics, because political actors act generally for their own politics, but for their own politics and for what they think are the right reasons, the Europeans begin now it seems to be pivoting away from following, following, following the United States to taking their own initiative. And I was fascinated to hear the Israeli response, or at least what seems to be the Israeli response to this new initiative headed by the British and the French with the uh, kosher sign of approval from the Germans, which is to develop their own formulation. No doubt it will be similar to other European formulations, which will be the basis of negotiations, the 67 lines with agreed territorial swaps. It will sound much like the American language, but not quite as good because of their own domestic politics. They'll talk about the division of Jerusalem. They won't completely refute the Palestinian right of return, which of course we here in the United States would always do. But putting that all aside, what's likely to happen or at least what might be likely to happen, is that for their own political reasons, the Europeans are likely to attempt to move this 
fall forward separate and independent from the United States. And what I started with was I was fascinated by the Israeli reaction because it seems to be so short-sighted. What they said was, the Europeans don't have the leverage to force an agreement on us, the Israelis, but they have the possibility of embarrassing us. Well, that's true. No doubt that's true. The Europeans don't have the leverage to force an agreement on the Israelis. And nobody in Berlin or Paris or British or, or London thinks otherwise. And surely at most, maybe they may, in fact, embarrass them. But that's not the point. That's not why the British are doing this. That's not why the French are doing this, and that's not why the Germans think it's a keen idea. The whole point of why Europe is moving is not to embarrass the Israelis. The whole point of Europe moving is to mobilize the United States. And think about it. I'm just playing this out in my mind. If they really get caught up with themselves, the Europeans, and they decide to talk the Jordanian king about it, which he seems to be keen about doing, and they talk to the Saudis, and they talk to the moderate Arab leadership, and should things get so crazy, and I'm not saying I'm advocating for this, because I'm not, because I don't want to put President Obama in a difficult spot. But if it winds up that the Europeans are so frustrated five months from now that they themselves bring their own initiative to the Security Council, not a boss bringing an initiative, not Turkey, or not an Arab nation bringing an initiative, but if it's a European-sponsored initiative at the Security Council, which largely resembles an American position, that may be an entirely different ballgame. And should that initiative happen to coincide in time with America engaging in full earnest strength in with, with respect to the Iranian nuclear program, that's a combustible potential. So respectfully to my Israeli friends, rather than analyzing this European initiative from the point of view of a lack of European leverage and the fact that it may or may not embarrass you, that's irrelevant. That's true. What you ought to be doing is analyzing this from a perspective of what if the Europeans really get to a point where they force America's hand, but more importantly to my Israeli friends, don't let it get there. Take the initiative. Beat the Europeans at their own game. And earnestly, Nathan talked about Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, Bar-Alan speech. Prime Minister Netanyahu, assuming he wins a substantial victory next week, he's got to bring his A game to Washington. Not his C game or his D game or his how can I confuse the Americans for another three and a half years game. He's got to bring his A game to Washington, go back to the point that Ambassador Ross made, I think, in his last comment, which is come to America with a plan that establishes the basic tenets of how Israel will preserve itself and prosper as a Jewish democratic state in a very tumultuous changing environment in the Middle East. There's not a single consequential American who doesn't fully appreciate that Israel has every right to protect itself as a sovereign nation and do what it needs to do for its security. And there isn't a single consequential American that doesn't understand the threat posed by the changing dynamic in the Middle East not the least of which is Syria and its chemical weapons, not the least of which what is happening in Egypt, not the least of which was the threat in Lebanon and Hamas and, of course, ultimately Iran. But also, there is also mostly an understanding that while it's not central to the resolution of these issues, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is still a significant matter that is better to be dealt with with Israel being proactive rather than being dictated to. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.